Welcome to Issues That Matter. Uh, I'm Cynthia Poole, and my guest today is Oliver Boyd, Boyd Barrett, sorry. And we're going to talk about current events and the truthfulness of the press. So, um, Joseph, give us an overview of what's really going on and how the press is covering it. Sure. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking with you. Thank you. Uh, on the subject of the press, it is something that I've been engaged with a long time across most of my career, as a matter of fact. I started off as a research assistant to a very famous British uh, scholar who recently died, Jeremy Tunstall. And he was one of the first, uh, certainly in the context of, the, of Great Britain, uh, he was, he, he was, I think, the first sociologist to take a serious interest in news. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be able to work with him to uh, interview dozens and dozens of uh, journalists working on the mainstream media in uh, Great Britain. Later on, uh, again, in collaboration with uh, Jeremy, I was also fortunate enough to work on a project that studied the role of the uh, major international news agencies of the world, including organizations like Associated Press, uh, United Press International at that time was one of the biggest ones, uh, Agence France Press of France, and uh, of course, uh, Reuters, which is now Thomson uh, Reuters, which um, at that time was based in uh, London. So I, I just say that, Cynthia, to indicate that uh, I do have a, a fairly strong background in the study of news media. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways that we can get into this topic about how the media cover international events. And I know that we probably all want to talk about uh, Russia uh, and Ukraine uh, and uh, Israel right now. And, yeah. I, 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 and I'm, I'm very interested in those issues. But may I just start by just making a few broad observations. Of course. Uh, I, when, when we talk about uh, whether media are telling the truth, uh, whether media um, fabricate. I, I, I think the best starting point is to remember that uh, for most of the time, the media genuinely are interested in verifiable information. Uh, although I am sometimes extremely critical of media coverage, I also have enormous respect uh, for most of those uh, journalists who work in this industry, most of them, by the way, grossly underpaid, except for the ones at the very top, of course. Uh, but we know that um, propaganda works best when it's dealing with facts. The problem, there isn't a problem with facts. Facts are facts. Um, but the problem with the way in which facts are covered uh, starts when journalists uh, start telling us some facts, uh, but not telling us other facts that if we knew about them would radically change our, uh, our understanding uh, of the situation. So if I can give an example of this, uh, and, and it relates to another element, another dimension of this uh, phenomenon, which is the truncating of history, which we always encounter uh, at the, particularly in the initial stages of the outbreak uh, of a major international conflict. And that is to say, uh, we are invited to believe that the crisis, whatever the crisis is, sort of started yesterday. Uh, and um, uh, we are not given access to uh, information which gives us, which would, if we were given access to it, would lead us to realize that the conflict has actually been in long gestation. And mm -hmm. issues of cause and effect are incredibly complex. Uh, and if we don't, if we are not, in, if we are not invited to deal with that complexity, we there is no possibility of our understanding anything. That is, I think, the main point uh, that I want to 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 make right now. So, may if, I, may I uh, ask a question? Um, you know, because I, I I watch cable TV. Do you think that the major cable news networks want to keep the public really uninformed? What do you think? 
I do think that the well, for, for the, for the first thing I think to say there is that our mainstream media, for the most part, uh, are business operations. Uh, they are in the business not only of making money, but also of surviving. Uh, they are owned uh, by, in for the most part, they are owned by much larger corporations. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those larger corporations have many, many other forms of money, many other business and financial uh, activities. I would say that the mainstream media in the United States uh, are at the very center of the US uh, system of capitalism. They have absolutely no uh, incentive uh, to anger uh, the, uh, the, the, the political system. They have no incentive uh, to become enemies of the political system. They are in the business of making money and surviving. And to survive, they work very closely with, hand in glove with, uh, the major levers or levers of uh, political power. So I would say that our mainstream media, and this, by the way, I should say this is a finding that has been confirmed over many, many decades across many, many different countries. Mainstream media, by and large, fall in line behind the foreign policy of their respective government. And there is no better example of that uh, than the mainstream media of the United States. But that's doing such a disservice to the uh, population as a whole, right? It's doing us an incredible uh, disservice. So we spent, uh, I think, uh, Cynthia, you and I are of, a, are of a similar generation, a similar age. So you and I um, have spent, what well, uh, we spent half of our, uh, at least half of our adult lives uh, experiencing the uh, the Cold War. And during that very long uh, interval, uh, mainstream media coverage of the world uh, was essentially bringing to our attention any information from any part of the world that seemed to be critical of the Soviet Union, that justified our continuing tension with the Soviet Union. That pretty much uh, blocked out all other forms of information. It was such a powerful driver of the information, the facts uh, that were brought to our attention. By And uh, since the end of the uh, so-called Cold War back in uh, 1990 to 1991, uh, uh, instead of our being able to return to a more normal uh, situation of uh, being in invited by the media to a broad raft of uh, neutral information about everything around the world. We're still in the same cauldron of tension and fabricated hostility. So that uh, uh, whereas once upon a time, the Soviet Union was demonized because of its uh, communist uh, character, uh, it, it is now being demonized for, for, for other things, for other reasons. And in particular, it's being demonized uh, as being um, uh, a, a troublemaker, so far as the United States is concerned, uh, in the con in the uh, European a a Asian uh, continent. Okay. I, go on. So, uh, no, I, I'm I'm sorry, Cynthia. Uh, please go ahead. No, I, I'm enjoying your, you know, what you're saying. So, you know, please go on. This is great. Yeah. So immediately after the um, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990 to 1991, uh, so we, we should have expected at that point, I think, uh, most of us did expect uh, that we would be entering into a new era of, uh, of international relations. Uh, it was, a, for a brief moment of time, uh, it was an extraordinary period of, of hope. Uh, that in fact human beings could arrange their affairs in a way that would be far less damaging um, and uh, would create far more opportunities for people all around the world. Well, sadly, uh, that, that didn't uh, come about. Uh, in place of seeking genuine uh, peace with, uh, with Russia, uh, once it uh, was no longer the Soviet Union, uh, the, uh, the United States, along with uh, some of the other uh, Western powers, uh, did everything they could to hinder 
the development of Russia. There's a very, very good example uh, given us by Jeffrey Sachs, who was uh, key uh, to the negotiations with uh, the emerging uh, uh, emerging Eastern European economies of that period together with, uh, with Russia. He had been able to negotiate very, very... Uh, uh, careful safeguards to protect uh, some of the East European countries with respect to their currencies once that they came out of the uh, the, the Soviet uh, ruble uh, system and adopted their own in, in, uh, um, uh, their own national currencies. And uh, Jeffrey Sachs was one of those who was able to negotiate uh, conditions uh, that would ensure that these countries would survive the dangers of uh, of intense inflation and a threat to their currencies. The United States stepped forward and protected these, uh, these new nations from the, uh, from the dangers of uh, the new financial order. But when uh, Sachs went to, uh, went, went to the White House to uh, suggest that the, the same generosity of spirit be extended to, uh, to the new Russia, to the Russian Federation, uh, that was flatly, flatly denied. Uh, in other words, the conditions for financial catastrophe were set by the United States right at the beginning uh, of this new era, despite the fact, perhaps because of the fact that uh, the gentleman, Boris Yeltsin, uh, who took over the new Russian uh, Federation, in circumstances, by the way, which I still think historically uh, uh, beg for further investigation and consideration whether that was actually a legitimate transition of power from the Gorbachev. Uh, president Gorbachev was the final last president of the Soviet Union. Boris Yeltsin was the first president of the Russian Federation. But that apart, Yeltsin, I think by general consent, was a tool uh, of the West. And when he went up for re-election in uh, 1996, he did so mainly because U.S. Uh, public relations agencies worked extremely hard and in all kinds of devious ways uh, to misinform the uh, the people of the Russian Federation with all kinds of fairy stories about the glories of capitalism and so forth uh, uh, to ensure uh, his, uh, his re-election. Uh, came along and uh, strangely enough, uh, one thing, one good thing that we can say about Boris Yeltsin, I believe from the point of view of the survival uh, of uh, Russia, which is, the, by the way, the largest territorial entity on the planet. Um, the survivor of Russia, Yeltsin did in his final months uh, identify uh, a, a young and competent uh, potential uh, replacement for himself, namely um, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, understood, uh, he he, uh, he had witnessed uh, several years of economic devastation across the Soviet Union, or rather across the Russian Federation, in its attempt to uh, uh, to, 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 to transition uh, from what we used to call a command economy, uh, an economy like the one um, in the Soviet Union, where every aspect of the economy basically was governed from the center, uh, to a market-driven. Uh, uh, this transition... I, I remember I, I myself visited uh, Moscow during this period and um, was astounded uh, to learn that this transition, it was expected that we could do this transition in the space of just a few months, uh, a transition that should duly, uh, in, in terms of due process, should really have taken a decade. Uh, so the, the, the results were horrifying. Uh, the death rate uh, fell dramatically, uh, or the the middle class of the of, of the new Russian Federation fell into poverty. Uh, there, there is not a soul alive in the Soviet in the, in the Russian Federation that does not remember these years with a memory of of absolute dread. Um, this is the hell that Vladimir Putin saved his people from uh, by re-establishing uh, central power uh, over uh, Russia. Uh, uh, controlling uh, Western influences, um, controlling the power of the new oligarch class that had been enriched with the encouragement uh, of the West by taking over what had previously been uh, state-led uh, enterprises. Uh, Vladimir Putin, and we could wish to see a bit more of this in the United States, insisted that the a, a country's government should be run by the government and not by uh, plutocrats 
not by oligarchs and not by foreign uh, enterprises such as, for example, just to pull a name out of a hat, the National Endowment for Democracy and other so-called uh, pro-democracy propaganda uh, uh, the regime change tools. Uh, so all of this history, to get back to our central point, uh, Cynthia, um, all, all of this history is totally forgotten, as is the history of uh, Putin's uh, constant attempts uh, to remind uh, the West, and in particular to remind the United States of the accord that had been reached um, uh, between uh, Washington and, uh, Ron and, um, and, and President Gorbachev, uh, that uh, in return for, I think, Russia's overwhelmingly generous uh, concession that East and West Germany should reunite, which I think in, re in retrospect may turn out to be uh, just another one of these uh, 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 terrible historical mistakes. Uh, but in, in return for Russia's concession uh, to uh, the reunification of Germany, uh, NATO would not uh, move uh, uh, one inch further east than it already was. Why NATO was allowed to continue at all once the Soviet Union uh, had uh, imploded, uh, it, it is itself a, a, um, a, 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 a very great problem, let me say. The organization's purpose had disappeared. The supposed enemy that NATO had been set up in order to protect Western Europe from, that supposed enemy had disappeared, and yet somehow it managed to keep going and it managed to keep going by finding all kinds of other things that it could mess about with both in Europe uh, and, uh, and in other parts of the world. We, even now we see NATO, NATO trying to get into not only the Middle East, but get into um, uh, parts of Asia, uh, that it was never designed uh, to have uh, anything whatsoever uh, to do with. Western media don't tell us anything uh, of this story, or when they do, uh, they distort it and they twist it, and they um, pretend as though uh, Putin is just—he's uh, a whiny kid on the block uh, from what they like to call um, uh, an, 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 an overinflated uh, a gas station, um, as though uh, Russia is somehow a trivial uh, but persistent uh, nuisance in the governance, in the wise governance uh, that the collective West provides to the rest of the, uh, the rest of the world. Putin, uh, in my view, is one of the greatest world leaders uh, we, we've ever we've, 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 we've ever seen. Uh, he's a man of enormous uh, restraint. I don't say that he's perfect. Uh, who is? Um, but if it comes to a leadership contest, uh, then uh, Vladimir Putin, in my view, uh, wins hands down uh, uh, against uh, the whole motley crew of uh, um, uh, neo-liberal, uh, uh, brainwashed um, Western politicians who are leading the collective, uh, the collective West. So, uh, Putin uh, actually explicitly told the world back in um, uh, in two thousand and eight that you know, you guys, if you persist. Uh, in extending NATO membership uh, right to Russia's borders, uh, this we, we we need to tell you, uh, this uh, we we see this as a direct threat uh, to our to our national security. So please don't go down there because if you do, there will be war. So he, t he told us back. He told us that back in the two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. uh, and what do, what did the collective West do? It kept. It kept going eastwards, of course. And then, um, as we saw in, uh, well, first of all, we see in 2014, the, uh, and again, the, the, the uh, Western mainstream media persistently get this wrong. Uh, the, um, in, in, uh, towards the end of 2013, we had major street demonstrations in uh, Kiev in Ukraine. Uh, th there was a genuine element to that. Uh, people in Ukraine were genu genuinely very upset by the extraordinary degree of corruption uh, in that country, uh, and they were protesting about that. 
many good, uh, solid, educated uh, middle class people were on the streets of uh, Kiev at that time. However, uh, the United States moved in. Uh, they uh, coordinated with uh, extreme right neo Nazi banderite movements. We can go into that if you will, if you will, um, uh, to uh, to 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 leverage this opportunity for regime change. Uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. When when you turn on the TV and and the uh, moderators and commentators are saying all this stuff, and it's totally fabricated. It's not true for the most part. Do they believe it, or are they lying and they have no conscience? The, yeah, it, uh, my 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 take is 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 this. I don't think that the we we there are, as you say, instances of extreme uh, fabrication, uh, and the and the uh, in order to implement uh, these examples of fabrication. The uh, the mainstream media are absolutely essential tools to the propagandists. It's not as though the mainstream media go out of the way simply to make stuff up for the hell of it. It's because uh, they are being responsive to, to to propagandists, and they are giving air, they're giving oxygen uh, to stories, to narratives that are coming from propaganda sources, uh, and promoting those uh, with whatever credibility the uh, main, mainstream media can give to them. So if we can go back in time, we have a number of very recent examples of course, but one thing that uh, has exercised me, and I've written quite a lot about it now, is the, uh, and perhaps, and probably most people have totally forgotten about this now, uh, but it's very, very important, is the shooting down of a Malaysian airliner uh, in 2014, MH17. And uh, the mainstream media, almost within hours, uh, decided, <laughs> they, they seem to know uh, almost, you know, within a couple of hours of this event happening, they, 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 they pretended to uh, they told the world that, well, yeah, the Russians did this. It, it's obvious that the Russians did this without you know, no, no possible investigation, no time at all uh, for them to know this with the degree of certainty that they prefer. Well, uh, to cut a long story short, I mean, that whole story that has been um, in progress for, for about 10 years now. We have seen a Dutch-led uh, uh, investigation uh, that um, uh, picking up from and apparently being driven by uh, a narrative originally spun by what I consider to be an intelligence operation, Bunning Cat. Uh, uh, the, 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 that narrative has now been endorsed, but it's an extremely suspicious narrative. We have, uh, at the beginning of every war, uh, we generally have it, uh, 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 instances of amazing fabrication uh, that are intended to make people uh, very angry with whomever the collective West has decided is its uh, enemy uh, de jour. And uh, we saw this, uh, there was a classic example of this back in uh, uh, 1979, 1980, 1981. That's the first Gulf War I'm referring to, uh, the babies in the incubators uh, narrative, where um, we were in the lead up to the vote in Congress as to whether we the United States would uh, play a role in uh, taking down uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, we were treated to this narrative. It was spun with the help of a large uh, Washington-based uh, public relations agency uh, that uh, Iraqi soldiers upon arrival um, uh, in uh, Kuwait uh, went into hospitals. And what do you know? What, the, what would you do, Cynthia, if you're invading a country? The first thing that you would do would be to go into any hospital you find, you, you look for incubators, and then you take the babies out. Uh, <laughs> if, if, so uh, after the war was over, this thing was exposed for the, for the lie that it was. Um, but the lie served its pur the purposes of the propagandists uh, very well, because the lie enabled uh, Bush uh, Sr. and his allies to push uh, consent for uh, the war uh, through uh, through through Congress, and um, thus enabled uh, the United States to uh, uh, mount its uh, with, with other members of the UN its uh, invasion force to uh, uh, to liberate this very tiny little oil producing enclave 
um, on the, uh, uh, that, that had actually once belonged to Iraq anyway. It was the British who separated Kuwait off uh, from, from, from Iraq. So the, the whole thing is embedded in one layer of lies and deception and imperial uh, self-regard uh, after another. And then uh, just the, just recent just the other day uh, in in Gaza, so we have the, it's it's usually it's vulnerable women and children and babies particularly that figure in these uh, atrocity stories. I don't say atrocity stories are necessarily untrue. Of course, often we do have the most terrible atrocities. Um, but the point is, uh, you need atrocities at a specific time because you have a message to convey. And the message is intended to make people really, really angry. And so you have to do it in a way, you have to spin a narrative for which you can provide some kind of some kind of visual evidence, preferably, um, and some kind of sources, uh, enough uh, to give it a certain amount of credibility, at least for a couple of days, so that it'll work for a while. Um, and uh, so you, you can't wait about for an atrocity to actually happen. You have to create your own atrocity. Uh, and in this instance, uh, we saw the other day the 40 uh, beheaded uh, babies. I believe now the story is that uh, these were actually AI generated uh, images, but by and large, they were, sense, I, I beg your pardon? They were AI? Yes, I, I believe that is the. Oh, the, my the, goodness. There's, 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 there's general concern. It's not as though we needed more atrocities. I mean, we knew already there was the atrocity of the uh, killing uh, of the young people at the um, at the at the music festival, uh, but but, uh, but but we need babies in particular. Babies are very important to atrocity stories. It was just like in uh, uh, in the in the run up to World War One, the British media. Uh, were full of stories about how uh, German soldiers, I think it was in Belgium, uh, were said to have um, uh, 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 bayoneted uh, babies wherever they could, and, and then 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 they would then they would eat the babies. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know you can imagine the vulnerability of the the, the, the broad British public at that time. <clears throat> the very very innocent days. Imagine that you know the, the idea of something like that being true. Of course. Any, any reasonable person is going to be totally outraged. And what, what do they want to do? They want to go to war with Germany to stop. The, 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 atrocity propaganda is incredibly important. I like to joke that probably uh, you know, the first day that you arrive as a novice to, uh, to MI6, uh, you know, they've probably got a textbook they want you to, how to do this kind of atrocity. It's probably lesson number one <laughs> you learn in the Western intelligence agencies, how to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. That's what they're in business to do. Right. You know, this has been this is an incredible conversation. And I'm sure that you have a lot to talk about. But um we've talked for a half hour already. So I'd like to have you on on an ongoing basis and to talk about what's going on because what you say is important. And for people who see this. To digest it all at one time, I'm sure is going to be very difficult. So I'd like to have you as a ongoing guest. We could talk about what's going on. And I think your insights and dialogue is extremely valuable. So would you, would you, okay, that, would you like that? Oh, of course, Cynthia, that would be uh, a, a tremendous uh, honor. And um, absolutely, just a just let me know. Okay, thank you. So you've been listening to uh, Oliver Oliver Boyd Barrett. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter. And if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure.